hello. I'd like to welcome you all to today's panel, uh, Revolutionary Justice, Radicalization, Ambivalence, and Revision. I'm Laura Mason. I'm from the Department of History at Johns Hopkins, and I would like to begin by thanking the organizers of the conference for their phenomenal work in transitioning this online under such extraordinary circumstances. Um, I will let everyone introduce themselves and then we will go ahead and have a conversation about our panel. Hello, so um, my name is Julie Johnson and I'm coming here from Melbourne. Um, we, we're currently in lockdown again, so um, it's good to be at virtual. Um, so I'm associated with the University of Melbourne because I finished my thesis there in 2017. Um, I've just had my book published called um, The Candle on the Guillotine, which is looking at revolutionary um, justice in, in Lyon. And uh, this talk that I've been doing is about Nevers. So um, what I'm most interested in is how the institutions of justice, which people had such optimism for them, how they, how they actually operated in practice in, in Lyon and now in Nevers. So um, that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Jay Smith at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I think I think it's fair to say that that my my work uh, deals in one way or another with political culture in the 18th century. Um, I keep getting closer and closer to the revolution, and, um, and you know my paper today reflects that that I'm, I'm in the 1780s now. Let's see. I guess I'm next. Um, <clears throat> I'm. Tim, Tim Tackett, I am retired retired professor at the University of California, Irvine. Um, I've been working on the French Revolution for many years, uh, recently published a book on the coming of the terror, and now we'll be publishing another book uh, coming out in some time next year on a kind of, uh, on a biography of an ordinary citizen and then that's uh, the basis of the talk, I, the talk I'll be giving today, or that I have given today, is uh, really one chapter in that book. Yeah, I'll talk more later. Uh, I'm Rod Phillips. I teach in the history department at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Um, I worked for a long time in the history of the family, especially the history of uh, divorce. Uh, but about 20, 25 years ago, I moved from divorce to wine. There's a sort of logic to that. And uh, I've written quite a bit on, on wine. Um, I published a history of French wine um, in 2016. And uh, next year, I will publish an edition of the wine diaries of the priest of Volnay in Burgundy uh, in the middle of the... Uh, 18th century. Uh, but the, my talk um, in this panel really takes me back to the period when I was working on the history of the family. So there's a, there's a bit of uh, reimagining and, uh, and uh, revision and reversion in this, uh, in this paper. Thank you. Thank you all. So although two of our papers are on the old regime, I think all of you are looking at the revolution. And so I want to begin with a question to you about how this work helps us think about the history of the French Revolution and might help us think about it rather differently. Um, most of these papers, I think, could in one way or another be characterized as um, micro histories. Um, and even if not micro histories, Rod Phillips' work, I think, um, fits in that category. It, it takes a little bit more forcing to make, to make your work fit um, as a microhistory, but it's still a very precise and kind of pinpointed history. But one of the things that strikes me about all of these works are the ways that they violate our expectations of revolutionary politics and revolutionary change. 
certainly Tim's paper does that most explicitly. He tells us about this fellow, Adrian Colson, who um, very loyally, not only very loyally serves a noble family at the end of the old regime, but <clears throat> helps this family squeeze their tenants for more dues, and yet ends up, um, as Tim puts it, as a supporter of Robespierre in 1793. So I'm not sure whether he's formally a Jacobin or not, but he's clearly a radical by 1793, and we don't see a real tension there. Um, Jay's paper might um, Jay's paper might be the one that would seem to take us most unproblematically into the revolution because he describes um, Antoine de Blanquet's effort to expose corruption, expose government corruption, expose corruption of a kind of emerging administration, which he characterizes as the emergence of a new political sensibility that prefigures the revolution. But I would point out, as Jay does at the end of his paper, that Blanquet is not successful. He is, in fact, outnumbered by people who do not want to fight this corruption. So again, how widespread might we see this new political sensibility? Julie's paper on Nevers and a riot in Nevers, on the one hand, would seem to confirm our ideas about religious change because you are describing a community that is almost evenly split between supporters and opponents of this refractory priest. On the other hand, you're describing a community that is also almost, almost evenly split over questions of public order and expectations of municipal authorities and justices of the peace. And so again, that raises questions about what that might tell us in a broader sense. Finally, Rod, your paper um, explores for us how the um, Tribunal de Police Correctionnelle, how so sort of um, rulings in those tribunaux really seemed to organize themselves around old regime ideas, that um, cases in which people attacked authorities or police were, um, were much more likely to be taken and condemned, whereas cases involving neighbors or communities and above all families were still treated as private matters. So are there ways that we can use these really precise cases and the kinds of cases you're discussing, are there ways that we can use the kind of surprising implications of these cases as a way of thinking differently about political change, legal change, um, and sort of cultural change in mentalities. What is this telling us about how people made this transition, made this sort of revolutionary transition, and what the implications were of the revolution for them and what the implications of their sort of preconceived ideas were for how they approached revolution. Okay, you're, you're posing that as a question now? I'm posing that as a question now, yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Jay. <laughs> it's a great you're question, on, Laura. You're on the screen for me. <laughs> great question. Um, I, I will just say, well, I will acknowledge first that the, um, uh, the cautionary note that you struck there at the end is fair enough. I mean, uh, clearly Blanquet was not all that widely supported and the work that he was doing in Monde in, in 1780 through 82. Uh, and he was, in fact, easily overpowered in the end by uh, the Bishop of Monde and, and all of his uh, many allies in the province. But, you know, in, in some ways, um, as I try to suggest in the paper, 
uh, his sense of isolation, his sense of singularity, uh, his, his own perception that he was working against a corrupt system that left him isolated is itself, I, I like to think anyway, um, evidence of an emerging sensibility. What, you know, what I suggest in the paper, I think in the title of the paper, somewhere in there, uh, is the, the sensibility of a whistleblower or someone who is a truth teller, who sees himself as a truth teller against all odds, against, uh, against a system that, that seeks to repress such truths. And, um, and so, so his sense of isolation and his, his knowledge that he was working against a system that in the end, I think he understood was likely to snuff him out as he, as he puts it at one point, uh, is, is itself proof that he was doing something new and, and that he was aware of doing something new. And I, I, I was just so fascinated by this, this run of correspondence that I happened upon in uh, Montpellier, as you can tell. I mean, I, I wrote a paper based on it, but in a way I was even more stunned when I did wider reading around the problem of Blanquet's correspondence and it happened upon the rhetoric of 1789 and, and 1790, 90, 91 and 92, where you find a lot of people sounding like Antoine de Blanquet. And I, I admit, I don't, I don't exactly know how to explain that. Um, was he prefiguring something, forecasting something? Is it coincidental? Uh, or were they all just part of a, a wider culture that, you know, doesn't have exact contours? I'm not sure exactly how to explain it, but it was striking to me how similar the rhetoric was between 1780 and Monde and, and 1789, 1790 in Paris. And, and um, so I think there's something going on there. Do you, do you think that, his sense of isolation in any way fosters his sense of urgency? I mean, is there a relationship between that sense of isolation and, and that sense that, that this is really something he's got to press onward with and that may tell us something about a kind of discovery of community toward the end of the, toward the, end of the decade? Yes, I do think that. I, I think that that, that, is, that becomes apparent particularly in the late winter and spring of 1782 when he's pressing the case especially hard and is also feeling most threatened. Uh, he fears for his safety in this period. And um, I mean, I think by early 1782, he already senses that the game is lost, that, um, that the, the bishop has rigged the <clears throat> the special investigation launched by the Estates General of Languedoc and um, and the the winds have shifted away from justice. He, he already knows that, but he's pressing hard nonetheless in 1782. And he's also, <clears throat> he's, he's also reporting that he's afraid he's about to be killed. <laughs> so, you know, uh, yes, there's a connection there. Mm -hmm between his, his sense of uh, the special mission on which he is embarked and um, his safety. Yeah. Can I, can I offer some, an observation at this point? Please. Okay. Jay, it was really an interesting uh, paper and I enjoyed it very much. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at an article I published in the Annale Historique de la Révolution Française on denunciation. I have. Okay. I, I only recently discovered it, but yes. <laughs> Please okay. continue. Okay. Well, you know, what can I say? I mean, first there was, there was indeed a whole discourse on denunciation, praise of this denunciation in the early revolution. Now, to a large measure, that was coming out of their their classical education. 
I'm pulling this out of I don't know who, Cicero or whoever. I'm not well read in that period. Uh, certainly that was the case for Desmoulins, but also probably Mirabeau. <coughs> but then I looked at the um, statistics of denunciation in one large town, Bordeaux. Right. Uh, made before, you've seen the article, I suppose, but made before the Jacobin Club there. And it's clear that the denunciations, there were a fair number of denunciations against um, malfaisance, uh, you know, graft and fraud and so on in, in administration. But the largest number of denunciations by far, over well over ha half, were against counter-revolution right. and, and um, <clears throat> the... Um, yeah. Yes. And, uh, aristocracy, the uh, the, uh, the fear and a fear of conspiracy of all sorts. So um, I think it would be interesting to try to link all this together. But the, the, clearly, the, idea, the concept of denunciation, which comes out so nicely in your in your paper, uh, is complex. Yes. <laughs> and, For sure. Uh, you know, it's worth worth thinking about on, in, in that regard. Right. Right. And, and Tim, remind me, it's been a couple of months since I read that article, but did, did you see any change over time between, say, 1789 and 92 or 3? I can't remember. Yes. Uh, at first, and I didn't go, let's see, it starts in 1791 to begin with. Okay. Yeah. And at that point, they're all talking about uh, aristocrats. They're uh, they're denouncing uh, various nobles. They're denouncing refractory clergy, and then little by little, and especially by ninety two and ninety three, they're beginning to not denounce each other. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's very much into the factional milieu of the Jerome yeah. and Paris versus the. Uh, Jacobins, which of course is especially relevant in the, the department of Girond, uh, which Bordeaux is, in which Bordeaux is located. So there is this curious evolution of uh, to, uh, beginning to, by denouncing others and then by and then moving more and more towards denouncing one another. Right. So, so to get at Laura's master question of whether these um, particular cases that were while looking at help us to think about the revolution in a different way. Uh, I had, I was hoping that this paper would suggest at least that, or, or would throw light on the fact that the origins of denunciation, which I think we tend to associate with, with factionalism, political wars, and so on, mm -hmm. had, um, um, I don't know, a more altruistic or, specifically governmental, at least, uh, mm -hmm. origin uh, from the old regime that, that provided a, a, a rhetoric and a, a, a practice of denunciation that could, was later appropriated and by others for different reasons and, and twisted in ways that uh, the people of 1789 wouldn't have anticipated necessarily. So that's, that's what I was hoping, the one of the things I was hoping this paper would suggest yeah, I think that's all very possible, but I, I do want to come back to the uh, strong uh, influence of class, their classical education. All the guys in the revolution have, all, in fact, all of the elite throughout France have had basically the same training. They know, they know Cicero by heart and uh, all this stuff about denunciation. A lot of it comes straight out of uh, the classical Roman literature. Right. But how was it adapted? Why was it adapted? Why would, did it become particularly strong at that point in time? These are all questions uh, that yeah. need to be explored more. So thank you very much. Very interesting yeah. article. Yeah. Thanks. Can I ask Julie and Rod, would you two like to sort of address this broader question of what your work, how your work might complicate our understanding of the revolution? I would love to, to do that because I, I thought um, Jay's paper was really great in, in showing that emerging idea and that it was greater than one man because he knew that he wasn't ever going to win.
but and I I find that prefigures what was happening in Nive. And um, I like your idea that if we look at, at micro history, it can disrupt a bit. Right. <clears throat> and uh, so I think by looking at Neuville and Lyon, sort of comparing how these new elected judges worked and, and, and also denunciation, because after all, <clears throat> the citizen was encouraged to, that they now had this right to go to their juge de pay and denounce somebody who was <clears throat> not necessarily counter-revolutionary, but um, that as well as doing the wrong thing. So that I think there, there, there's this big overarching idea of what duty revolutionaries had, that it was more than, than, their, than was going to help themselves. So in a way, I think it's naivety, but also it's... Um, it's that idea of talent that um, has been mentioned in the papers and, you know, these new ideas of duty. So, so I believe that in, um, in Nevers, it was quite different to Lyon because I, I found in Lyon, there were um, the people who were first elected as juge de pay and um, mag citizen magistrates. Um, <clears throat> they were professional sort of classes but in Nevers, they, they were much more radical much sooner. <laughs> and it really surprised me. So I, I think that's how it helps to look at micro historically at different places to see, to see what, how actually the people use the, their ability to vote in judges, their ability to denounce people. Um, and then that might challenge, you know, some if we just say concentrate on Paris all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hope I've been clear there. I'm not sure. Yeah. Can I, inter can I intervene here too? Uh, Julie, it's really exciting to see how far you've progressed since we first met. I don't know when it was. <laughs> talking about you. I admire your week, as you know. What's your research project? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to make. Uh, one comment on the interesting, um, your interesting observations on dechristianization okay, yeah. comes out. And I want to point out and remind you that the Nivernais is an area of intense dechristianization. Uh, yes. both, but that there is a big debate over this. When and how did this happen? And I guess you probably know uh, Vauvel's books on this subject and whether this was a the Christian, the Christianization spontané ou provoqué, and the, the, the idea that they're actually the Jacobins are actually uh, coercing Fauché into promoting the Christianization is something I've never heard of before. And I think that was really it's clearly, it's, this is clearly more spontané than provoqué. Uh, so at least you know I'm I'm proposing that you might want to put this in a larger context of. Uh, a huge research on dechristianization. Lyon, on the other hand, is a very different place. And at least in the city of Lyon, uh, there was a strong kind of Orthodox Catholic uh, tradition. And well, you know the whole story. Um, so anyway, those are my off the cuff <laughs> observations on your very interesting paper. Thank you. Yeah, I quite agree. I was very um, surprised at how how influential they were on Fouché. Fouché stayed there in Nevers for quite a while and he was getting his child baptised and, you know, the Jacobins of Nevers told him, you know, you shouldn't do this. This is not, you know, this is not a good revolutionary practice. And then, and then Fouché becomes radicalised and, and sort of participates in the terror in Lyon afterwards. So, yeah, it, they, they had a, a lot of... I have to look more at that, actually the de-Christianization having commenced it. Sure. Hmm. Uh, well, as, as you said, Laura, my, uh, my papers are somewhat different from the other, from the other three. Um, is there anything that complicates our understanding of the revolution? I'm, I'm not sure. I think uh, in, in a way, some of what I found I was to me not, not very surprising. Uh, there are certain continuities here. But I think what, um, 
you know, what strikes me is that here you have this, here you have this new court, the uh, Tribunal de Police Correctionnelle, um, and the judges have uh, pretty, pretty clearly drawn legislation to apply, and they don't want to apply it. I mean, in the, in the case I start with, with this woman who is, uh, who is attacked by her husband, uh, they, first of all, they don't cite the legislation that they should, they should apply. They refer to Roman law, and this is in 1797. Well, you know, Roman law is well and truly gone by then. Um, so apply to Roman law, and then they make this general statement about, you know, family disputes should not be, should not be fought in public. They, you know, it's all, it's all very private. On the other hand, you know, all of these cases, except for the, except for the cases against public officials, all of these cases are brought by individuals themselves. And they come to the court to get justice. They come to have, you know, justice, uh, revenge, retribution, honor restored, something like that. So they go to the court, and I don't know how, you know, how, uh, to what extent they understood the details of the jurisdiction of this court, but they went, understanding that they could get justice there, and they often find that they were thwarted in that by the, uh, you know, by the, by the juge de paix. Sorry, that's my cat's tail. Um, and, um, you know, so there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a disconnect between the judges and the people uh, that, that they're, uh, that they're, you know, who, who are coming, coming to the courts. And as for the, you know, but there are these strong continuities, you know, the reluctance to intervene in family disputes and, uh, and that, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, it, you know, in, you know, insofar as that's the case, then it's, uh, it's quite clear that, that, uh, you know, much of the legislation is simply is, looks good on the books, but is, uh, is simply not being put into practice. But it does, I mean, that raises, I think, a really interesting question about how, sort of how a revolution can appeal to people um, when its innovation is, is, is not being respected. I, you know, the kind of tension you say, you know, people are bringing these cases before the court and the judges are not enacting revolutionary legislation. So, I mean, it's an interesting reflection on, um, on a kind of nibbling away of revolutionary respect, respectability in the sense of like the revolution being something that people can rely upon and trust in. Yeah, I, I think that's probably probably right. I, mean, I should point out that you know all of these cases I was looking at are from the years five to seven, mm -hmm. and there were, uh, uh, when I the both the uh, the archive Depart departemental in uh, in Montauban, Dijon uh, that I was looking at. I was pretty pretty certain that the uh, that the cases, the records from the earlier years, were not complete. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, they were very very thin compared to uh, compared to from the year five onwards. So I didn't I didn't look at. So I can't tell if there's a shift over time. Mm -hmm. So I I would just like to to add that I think that time is. Um, of when the cases were heard is, is really important because by 1795, I think there was a chipping away at how these courts would operate. Mm -hmm. And there, because when you look at the developments later with Napoleon, they, 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 by 1795, people were going to the, the correctional tribunals because they were judges alone so that they were actually doing that on purpose to get away from the jury system so, um, and that would result in the Napoleonic changes where they sort of you know made, um, made a lot of inroads as to how those those um, elected judges would operate and and I think Donovan has, James Donovan has written a lot about about how those changes happened. Right. Right. So I was wondering if you had, I was going to ask you if you'd had, saw a difference in any earlier cases than 1795. Well, I mean, the, most of the, um, you know, uh, there was a tribunal de, de famille, right? That, that, that ran until the year, until 1796, uh, year four. And uh, that handled, but that was a private, that's a private, it's a private uh, arbitration system of uh, family members and neighbors and friends and, and that kind of thing. 
I mean, taken over by the by the lawyers. But uh, so in in a sense, the uh, the cases that to many of the cases, at least before the uh, uh, the tribunal de police correctionnelle, might have ended up in this in this other system before that. So I mean, there's a bit of a problem of just the of discontinuity of, of courts and and therefore records. I, could I could I uh, uh, just basically re ask a question that I floated on email among the four of us, five of mm -hmm. us, uh, a couple of days ago, Rod, about your paper, and that, and that is the, the question of whether this may be terribly naive on my part even to think such a thing, but whether there's a uh, a carryover of judicial culture or just culture uh, between the old regime and the revolution um, manifested in the way that the judges try to keep the peace within families and, uh, and, and in neighborhoods. Uh, or or is, is that something new going on? I don't know. I, I just don't know. But it made me wonder. My clear sense is that there's a continuity. Yeah. And a continuity that actually runs into the 19th century as well. It's, I mean, it runs into the 20th century for that matter. Yeah. I mean, there's a, a, a real reluctance on the part of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the courts to get involved in what they, what they consider to be intimate matters. Mm -hmm. and that's uh, intimate with, in, a, in, a fairly broad, in a fairly broad sense. Yeah. Um, and, and a belief that you know, certain institutions, whether it's family or neighborhood, even employer, employee, um, uh, uh, renter, and and uh, um, <laughs> whatever the alternative is, uh, you know, these the, 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 the should be you know regulated by the parties themselves as much as possible. Right. Is this out of a reluctance to disrupt patriarchy, for example, um, patriarchal relationships? Certainly would seem that way with families. Fam family, I would think that's probably true. Um, neighborhood, I don't necessarily think mm. so. I, I, I did a bit of a gender analysis, but the numbers were very small, so I didn't, I didn't uh, make much of them. Uh, but most, um, most, of these fam most of these neighborhood issues are males and males. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I do, but I do think that there's something of a, that there's a, a problem with sort of leaping from 1788, 89 to, you know, 95, 97, given sort of jumping into this really conservative moment in the revolution and given the kind of, the, the, the sorts of radical projects to reshape um, family and family ties and family authority from the middle period of the revolution, from, you know, 92, 93, 94. So it, I, I mean, it does sort of raise a question, even if there's a continuity in the long term, um, whether this is a continuity that's been disrupt disrupted and the kind of change, the, the, the kind of effort to restore order that you're seeing is in fact an effort to restore order, not a kind of consistent um, transformation that runs across the whole revolution. Yeah, yeah, and that I, do, that I don't, I think is, I think is a good, an excellent point. Uh, and that I that I don't know. I have to get back into that, mm. get back into those records, and and uh, you know find a, a good run from 1790 through to uh, through to the the end of the period. Yeah. And yeah. Tim, can I ask you? You know, you spoke about other people's papers. Can I ask you to speak a little bit about Adrian Colson and how do you make sense of his? experience and his particular allegiances in the 1780s and his more sort of radical inclinations in 1793. I mean, do you see him having a sense of a kind of dissonance between his old regime experience and his revolutionary experience? Is this something he just kind of glosses over? I'm curious. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a very difficult question and a fascinating question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Adrian Coulson, as 
somebody I've been thinking about for a couple of years now. Uh, he's a nobody in some ways. He's a or very ordinary citizen. He uh, never published. He never was elected to any committee or any organization. There are no portraits of him whatsoever. But we have this marvelous insight into his life and thought in the over, over a thousand letters that are preserved that he wrote from 1788, no, 1778 to 1797. It's a wonderful source. Um, and what do I conclude? You know, it, the article, the uh, paper I gave today uh, actually doesn't say very much about the Fr French Revolution, except in a, in a kind of coda in the very last paragraph. Uh, but you're right. He changed pretty dramatically. And there is, I, I believe, an absolutely a cognitive dissonance in his thought uh, <clears throat> from the very beginning. He does not expect revolution at all. There's no evidence whatsoever that he anticipated the revolution. He's amazed by it all. And this is interesting because I, I would argue that it's not, the letters are re revelatory not only uh, about this one man, but about his whole, the whole section of Paris, the whole neighborhood of Paris in which he lives. He is a very minor figure. And his best friends are the, um, the candle maker and the mason and the uh, innkeeper across the street, uh, feature sans culotte. So that he is actually quite a, an interesting voice revealing the way things are going. And as far as I can tell, none of these people expected a revolution. So that's the first point. Uh, how did he end up in the mountain as a, as a supporter of the mountain? Uh, it's a long story and I didn't get into it in this uh, paper at all. Uh, but as I say, it, it, there, there are absolutely ambivalences in his thought and in his itinerary. Um, he feels extremely devoted to the nobles that he is uh, representing and defending. And yet very quickly, he comes to detest the aristocrats. And he f uh, imagines aristocratic plots everywhere. Um, he uh, <clears throat> embraces equality and liberty and so on. And yet he continues to show deference towards these two nobles. He even shows, continues to use their seigneurial titles after those titles have been abolished. And after the, uh, one, of, one of the marquis says, don't do this anymore. I'm not a marquis anymore. He continues to call him a marquis. Um, I think this, uh, how he becomes, how he is radicalized, we could say, is complex. Clearly the brochures he is reading already in 1788-89 are important. He's not, he lives not far from the Palais Royal, and he goes there very frequently to read the latest brochures and this great uh, flood of brochures coming from all around France. And, this, and he takes them back to his neighborhood and reads them to his friends. Um, there's no doubt that later his uh, adherence to his section played a role in his radicalization. This is a section that would become very radical. But interestingly enough, he also remains a very religious man. Uh, <clears throat> he may well have been a seminarian in his youth. We, I've never been able to prove this. But there is good evidence of this. He may have once directed, been directed toward the priesthood before he becomes a lawyer. And he's certainly quite devout and even orthodox. He doesn't like Protestants, uh, but all of that changes. All of that changes also in the course of the revolution and his attitude toward religion is one way in which we can really see how he, his thought is being radicalized. Uh, he is, he continues to practice Catholicism, go to the mass, take part in all the ceremonies of the liturgical year. His church is just around the corner. And the church, <laughs> interestingly, not interestingly enough, becomes the uh, 
auditorium in which the section meets. So there's a clear continuity between his um, parish and his section. So all of this helped us to explain sort of how he becomes more radical and embraces that and ultimately the Montagnard position. It's curious because his next door neighbor is the Louvet family. And is it Jean-Baptiste Bouvet, the, the bête noire of Robespierre, uh, lives right next door. But he doesn't like him. And <laughs> he very quickly uh, and would come to join the National Guard and would march against the Girondin on the 2nd of June, 1793. So it's a long, complicated story. It's not a story I could recount in this particular paper paper itself is more about his, what, what he can tell us about relations with the nobility before the revolution. But uh, uh, voila, that's, I guess, what I can uh, say about that. <laughs> if I may, I have a quick question and a comment. Please do. So, so Tim, does he, does he eventually repudiate religion or his religion? Does he? Not at all, not at all. And he doesn't. No, okay. and I would argue that a large number of sans culottes even do not repudiate religion. Mm -hmm. Christianization in Paris is led by a very small minority. Uh, in 1792 and 93, they're still practicing uh, the uh, midnight mass and the uh, Corpus Christi uh, processions and so on. And he's, and unfortunately, the letters become silent. After, I mean, he just stops talking about politics for obvious reasons yeah. uh, after the terror begins. Mm -hmm. It's clear that up until the terror, he's, he continues to support uh, uh, religion and yeah. practice. Well, I, I just want to say that I think that uh, your, your guy, uh, Goldson, uh, illustrates as well as any of our papers do, probably better what Laura's point was, namely that you can use his case to rethink so much about the revolution. Like what, what is the appeal of the revolutionary message? What draws someone to, to be into being, you know, sympathetic yeah. with the Jacobins? Yeah. Uh, uh, he, he's clearly, he's not playing to type. No, he clearly, there's no evidence whatsoever that he read anything but, uh, but in the canonical and light, he just doesn't ever talk. He talks about some of the things he read, but never mentions Rousseau or Terre, Diderot, et cetera, et cetera. Not, not at all. And once again, he seems just stunned at the time of the uh, calling of the um, Assembly of Notables. He doesn't, can't figure out at all why they're being called. Uh, and it's only little by little that he begins, begins to realize that this is a big deal. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, you know, he is not representative of the whole of France. I think he is representative of a section of central Paris, uh, of which he is a member and has a lot of close ties. Okay. Okay. Laura, any more? Uh, Laura, are you speaking? I can't hear you. Oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm just wondering if anyone has anything further to add. I, I mean, I'm thinking more, Tim, about your point about sort of Colson being surprised. And <clears throat> but in a sense, like, I mean, one of the things I think you, one of the things you, your work is pointing us toward is the degree to which we have to um, think about particular appropriations of revolutionary ideas and what they what they mean to particular individuals. Um, it's a way of kind of breaking down a, a monolithic sense of revolutionary ideology. Mm -hmm. um, yes. That's true. <laughs> to, to Interesting to uh, to sort of follow him from the old regime into the into the revolution and and um, you know see which what choices he makes 
because there are, there are critical moments, aren't there, in which you, you know, you've got to make the right choice or I got a one choice or another choice. If you make the wrong choice, I mean, there are certain dangers attached, uh, attached to it as well. And uh, but do you find, a, is there a sort of a unifying, I mean, I don't know, like a unifying theme, a unifying ambition, aspiration, anything like that, that, that sort of helps you to, helps, helps you to understand these, uh, these shifts over time? As I say, uh, I see a lot of ambiguity, ambivalence, uh, wavering in his position over time. He um, begins by praising the king for, before the revolution. He, he, he backs the king above the parliament and above the uh, assembly of notables. And he would continue to back the king until the, I guess, the, until the uh, royal uh, session of, uh, what was it, uh, June 23rd, 1789, which leaves him stunned. Uh, and very unhappy. But then he comes back to the king, you know, and the, 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 when the king comes before the National Assembly on the 4th of February, 1790, he says, this is great. The king was, was just mistaken. He was misled. You know, and you see this going back and forth and back and forth on the king. You can see much the same in his attitude towards the, um, towards the common people. He actually supports, strongly supports the, the common people uh, in, in riots before the revolution. He, there's a riot in uh, uh, the, the, the uh, town in Berry that where um, the noble family he represents holds lands. And he goes to the, one of the magistrates in the Parliament of Paris to try to defend these people. He says, they're, they're, they're just mistaken. Don't, don't treat them so hard. They're not traitors. Uh, they shouldn't be strongly punished and so on. And then, but then he wavers during the revolution. He's not happy with the, uh, the, uh, the riots, of, the Réveillon riots. He's very unhappy with some of the other, he certainly, very unhappy with the September massacres. And yet he also support, clearly has feelings for the little people around him. Now it's just, it's, there is no single, I, I guess that's the, one of the, one of the um, abiding conclusions of my thoughts on this guy is that he, you know, there is no simple linear description of his thought. Uh, and I suspect that that's the case with a great number of uh, biographies that one might write. Uh, when, one, when, does one, when one does write a biography, we have a tendency to see this unif unified thought, or at least a unified linear development. But I suspect that that's often not the case at all. It's more in the mind of the historian. And it's certainly not the case with, of Colson. <laughs> Uh, his, his, his attitude toward women also is quite fascinating. And it comes out and, uh, he, yeah, I won't go into, won't, no, no point in speaking on this uh, at length. But you'll read the book and see what you think <laughs> eventually. But, um, uh, yeah. Well, cognitive, cognitive dissonance is a good word, I think. Right. Okay. Well, we're getting um, the message that we need to wrap up. So um, I will thank you all for sharing your papers and for having this conversation about them and for allowing me to participate in it. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Laura. Thank, thank you, Laura. Thanks for that. And thank you, everyone else. Thank you. Yeah, all. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>